Yes, so we can start. Uh, thank you, friends, for uh, your presence today, and I'm delighted to present on uh, cognitive biases today. Uh, this is one area which affects all of us, and a lot of times uh, these intuitive decisions we take, we are not even aware of why we are doing that or how we come to a decision. So uh, I've done some research on this topic recently, and I'll be sharing uh, some of that with you. I'm sure you'll find that interesting because it relates to our everyday life. So as I go along, if there are questions or there are observations, please let me know so that uh, I can address them as we go along. So uh, this is based on uh, behavioral sciences. I'm sure uh, most of us realize that a lot of uh, the things that we do in uh, media and communication studies is taken from behavioral sciences. So uh, it's again a good opportunity to talk about all that and also try and relate it to uh, media and communication also as I go along because uh, that also is a very important uh, part of uh, the uh, cognitive uh, bias and all these processes. So uh, why 18? So before I start, I must emphasize uh, 18 is not an exhaustive number. This could have been uh, anything, but uh, given the time and given the uh, kind of uh, things that I wanted to talk about, this is one number that I just, uh, that is stuck on me. But uh, there are many other uh, uh, cognitive biases. Some of them are related to each other. But it's not an exhaustive list by any means. We have a lot of books on 25 cognitive biases. There are sites which talk about 30 odd biases, so on and so forth. So 18 is not an exhaustive list by any means. But I have chosen the ones which I thought would be uh, very relevant for a discussion like this. Uh, as I go along, I'll uh, talk about you know the reasons why these biases could uh, go on and uh, how it affects uh, our decision making. Before I start, I must talk about uh, this gentleman, Daniel Kahneman, and uh, I'm sure uh, uh, we've heard about him when we talk about the framing theory. And uh, he is uh, uh, one person who is responsible for a lot of the heuristics that we will be talking about. So in 1974, they came out with a paper and all. So I'll talk about all that. So with Daniel Kahneman and Tversky, uh, they were kind of pioneers in the field. And they even began what is known as behavioral economics, where uh, it's not about people taking uh, rational decisions as uh, economists would believe, but it depends on how uh, maybe these choices are framed or how people uh, see a particular thing as risk or not a risk. So why, uh, how people take decisions may not always be consistent. And uh, over, over the last four decades and more, uh, Kahneman and others, they've been talking a lot about uh, these things. So uh, in, uh, this is how you define uh, um, these uh, heuristic biases or uh, you know, intuitions, basically. We normally allow ourselves to be guided by impressions and feelings. And the confidence we have in our intuitive beliefs and preferences is usually justified, usually justified. So we have a situation where we talk of expert intuition, somebody who's been doing something on a regular basis. He has, you know, that kind of an intuition where uh, without getting into the details of a subject, just by having a cursory look or just by having a glance or just with a limited amount of information available, uh, he can draw or she can draw conclusions based on intuition only. And uh, very often they are justified. So when we're talking about biases, we are not necessarily talking about something which is uh, uh, inherently bad. It's just that we want uh, us to be aware of what these biases are. A lot of the times when we make these decisions, they might not be guided by a long uh, thought behind it or by, as we say, uh, some reasonable logic we put into it. Very often, these impressions and uh, feelings, they guide the intuition that we go for. Uh, and this is what uh, Kahneman talks about, uh, heuristics. So we make judgments consciously or unconsciously about various things. And often this violates the law of logic and probability because uh, uh, I will talk about the prob probability and logic details. But uh, as I said at the beginning, this will be more about uh, what we face in, an every, in our everyday life without getting into uh, too much of the technical details. But often we make these judgments based on simple heuristic decision rules or mental shortcuts about uh, uh, our own experiences, about uh, how we decide uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, certain uh, conclusions, so on and so forth. So uh, this is one uh, shortcut we use for 
making a lot of decisions in our everyday life. And uh, this is often justified because we do not have time to go into that slow thinking. It, we do not have uh, information most of the times. We do not have all the information that is required to reach to a foolproof decision or uh, even there are no optimal solutions in sight at times. So there are there are different occasions where uh, these things are very very necessary. So as I said, it's not uh, necessarily something uh, which is uh, 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 something that has to be avoided at all costs. There are reasons why these uh, biases are there, and we will just talk about those uh, reasons in a uh, moment's time. So as I said, it's justified at times. So uh, what are the, uh, this is one picture that I got from the internet. So this is just to uh, you know, set the base as we go along. So uh, what are the common uses of for these heuristics? First of all, it reduces the mental effort needed to make the decision. And that's a very uh, important characteristic that the system itself evolves into, that we do not at times make a lot of mental effort into a decision. So when, when our... Uh, uh, effort is all into the mobile phone, for example, a lot of the questions we just answer or maybe, you know, the uh, expert drivers and that can be very uh, scary at times when they're driving, they just depend on their mental uh, uh, heuristics to make a decision while, while they are uh, kind of scrolling down their mobile and they are uh, driving. So it can be there. So uh, the uh, uh, mental effort can be divided into that thing. And it can simplify complex and difficult questions. We'll see uh, in a moment's time. They're also a fast and accurate way to arrive at a conclusion. So that happens in instantly. So we'll be talking about two different mental models inside us, which uh, we keep, uh, uh, we arrive at without often knowing what we are doing. And it also helps in uh, the problem solving uh, processes. So this is just a, a very simple explanation of the common uses of for heuristics. Uh, there are uh, three different reasons why uh, uh, these heuristics uh, uh, take place, and we will talk about those three different reasons. So why do we arrive at a particular decision based on those mental shortcuts? So I'm giving the reasons first, and then I will come to the biases. One of the reasons is that there is a, the, uh, there is a very limited amount of information available. And uh, even if you have a lot of information available, you make use of whatever uh, is, is required to come into a decision. So we often do not, even if information is available, we do not avail of all the information. So uh, the cognitive biases could be, number one, due to uh, limitations in available data. There, there might be very less data available. And also because the human mind simply is not capable enough to process all the information that is uh, there. So that is why we use these simple mental shortcuts, especially in complex and unfamiliar or uh, uh, uncertain terrain. And uh, also, you know, when we, we have uh, time constraint situations. Also, as I said, as I uh, keep on repeating, because of uh, the limited bounded rationality or, or limited rationality or the bounded rationality concept, which suggests that we can only process a limited amount of information. So that is one reason why we refer to these heuristics or we refer to these shortcuts while making decisions without even knowing that we are uh, going through this, these shortcuts. Another is again a very important thing that we have evolved over the years and there are so many things that we can talk about this ecological, uh, uh, sorry, the evolutionary is the next one. This is the ecological perspective. So there might be a mismatch between the uh, heuristics and the context. So your uh, uh, heuristics or your shortcuts possibly are based on another environment and you are trying to use it in a very different kind of an environment. And that is where a lot of mismatch can occur. That is where a lot of the decisions we make might not always be uh, true or they, they might not always be the best possible decisions. But as I said, they are based on the spatiotemporal regularity. Spatiotemporal means in a that our uh, experiences are basically based on a particular space in a particular time. But when we try and apply it to a very different kind of a space and a different time, then they might not always uh, work fine. So uh, the context and the environment in which we work, uh, it's more suited to that kind of a uh, situation. So if we are in a particular uh, ecology and then we apply that, then probably it works better than when we don't live in that kind of an environment. And the third reason why these uh, uh, biases work 
is because of this evolutionary perspective. And there are so many things that we can talk about that, that over the years, our mind has evolved into the situation that we are here today. So we uh, talk a lot, lot about the uh, amygdala, for example, that is the brain, which uh, that is a part of the brain, which prepares us for impending danger or which tells us that there is danger. So people who did not have the amygdala, they were uh, lost in the evolutionary process. So the people who have survived are the ones who uh, have the amygdala. So this goes on for uh, generations. This is not a new thing, but there are biases. For example, uh, I'll just refer to one bias. I'll talk about this when I uh, talk about the bias itself later on, the action bias. So uh, when we have a situation in which probably there is no rational justification to uh, uh, take an action, but for evolutionary reasons, because our forefathers have been taking action whenever it was required or when they thought that there was a justification for action, they do take action. So uh, uh, given a situation where you either have to take an action or not, not take an action, often we go up uh, taking the action. And I will talk about that in details. But as I said, you know, this is from the evolutionary perspective that as we evolved over the years, uh, we got used to taking action on certain situations based on the dangers or based on the uh, uh, pro possible advantages of taking that action. So that uh, is one of the reasons. So as I said, these are the three reasons we talk about generally. There are many other reasons. One, as I said, is the uh, cognitive uh, psychological perspective. The other is the ecological perspective and the evolutionary perspective. Uh, also, uh, the, there is the association principle. There are many other principles, but as I said, in a 45 to 50 minute lecture, we are trying to uh, bring in the most important parts right now. So the brain automatically searches for correlation, coherence and connection. This is always looking for connection. And that is why good journalism is always about associating one thing to another uh, so that you can draw your meanings in a better way. So this associative way of uh, perceiving, understanding and predicting, it arranges our observations into regular orderly uh, patterns or relationships. That is why very often when we see something like that, we think that it must fa fall into that particular block. And these blocks are the evolutionary uh, biases that I have spoken of and I will talk of as well. Now, all these things are uh, there and these two very, very important uh, publications. There are many others and uh, we uh, keep on going from these publications again. But one is this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So I will just explain what this uh, fast and slow thinking is. And as I said, uh, there was this particular uh, paper published in the Science Journal in 1974, where they talk about these uh, biases and these uh, judgments that we uh, make under uncertainty, as they say that what are the heuristics and what are the biases that uh, we are exposed to. So this is by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Amos Tversky uh, died uh, uh, at the age of 59 and he was not there when Kahneman got the Nobel Prize. Otherwise, they would have got it uh, jointly. So uh, this is these are uh, two of the uh, publications that I think are very important. And there are many others that I will talk about as I go along. but uh, my presentation has largely been guided by uh, these two publications. So as I said, the uh, thinking fast and slow is one we must understand before we get into the biases themselves. So the uh, there are two systems that operate in our uh, uh, brain. The first system, it operates automatically and quickly with almost no effort. And there is no sense of voluntary control where we uh, straightway we make decisions. So if I just show you an angry face, you will immediately draw a lot of conclusions about that particular person. Or if you say some, or if, if there is somebody who's, who's you know, just uh, throwing around trash inside a train compartment, just by one look at that person, you are drawing a lot of conclusions about that person. And most of us, we do. And most of the times it might be correct about that particular person. So that is the system, one of the brain, which operates automatically and quickly. And the system two, it requires a lot of mental activity, including co uh, complex computations. So if I give you a large division or a multiplication, that is where you can't have a very simple, straightforward answer. You will need to uh, take a calculator or uh, go for uh, 
some manual calculations or whatever to get the answers. So the operations of system two are uh, the agencies of agency. Agency means you are doing it yourself by choice. You are uh, making the choice to expend more cognitive energy onto that particular uh, object or onto that particular problem. And it also requires a lot of concentration. So roughly speaking, these are the two systems that uh, are there in the brain that system one, it operates voluntarily. There is no effort on our part or little effort on our part. It is based on our experiences. It's based on the mental shortcuts, which, uh, which we have acquired over the years and the system too. So as you can understand without even going into the details that which one would be the fast and which one would be the slow. So uh, Kahneman talks of system one as the fast thinking and system two as the slow thinking. It's not as if two different people, but it's as if these are two different systems uh, inside our brain. Uh, there's been a lot of research on these system one and system two, although uh, people uh, describe it differently. So uh, uh, these are the typical correlates that they talk about the system one and system two. So the first part is fast. It is high capacity, means it can take a lot of decisions immediately. It's uh, parallel, so it, it doesn't take you know one after the other. It's just parallel. It's non-conscious. You're uh, often not even aware of uh, what you're doing. Uh, responses could be biased. And that's what we're talking about. It is contextualized. It is based on uh, a particular context. It's automatic, uh, automatic, it's associative, and it is experienced based. And this is independent of the cognitive ability, which we otherwise have. Otherwise, we might be having a lot of other cognitive abilities. But when we do this uh, fast thinking, that is where we are not even applying these cognitive abilities. So uh, I will not go into uh, more details of that. But the slow part, as I said, the system two thinking, it's slow, it's of limited capacity because at one point of time, you can do just one kind of a thing. Uh, it's serial, uh, uh, there's a linear approach to that. It's conscious, you're aware of what you're doing. The responses are normative. These are uh, idealized responses. They can't, they may not be biased. They might not be correct, but they are normative uh, responses. Uh, it's not contextualized, it is abstract. It is not based on a particular context. It is controlled, it's not automatic, and it is rule-based. It's consequential decision making and it is correlated with cognitive ability. So if you are using uh, uh, the system two, it depends on your cognitive ability. The first one may not depend on your cognitive ability. It's uh, similar for everyone. Now, having established this base, we can go on to talk about the 18 uh, biases that are the subject of this particular discussion. So I'm sure this background is, is uh, enough to uh, talk about the details that we are going to talk about. These are the three uh, things that Kahneman talks about uh, in the heuristics. One is representativeness, how much representative it is. Uh, availability, uh, how much of the information is available. Adjustment and anchoring. I will talk about anchoring when I talk about the anchoring bias. So these are the uh, things which are uh, responsible for representativeness. If need be, I will come back to that. Uh, these discussions uh, at a later time. This is about availability, means uh, whether you are able to retrieve instances that are provided to you, whether when you're searching for something, how effective that kind of a search is, or what are the imaginations you are uh, using when we, uh, we are talking about the things that are available to us or the information that is available to us. And oftentimes the correlation that we draw might not be correct. So these are the things that uh, fall under the uh, availability uh, paradigm. And uh, there is an anchor position which I'll talk about, but as I said, I will not uh, talk in greater details about it here because uh, that, is, that is one of the biases that we will be talking about. Another very important thing that we must be aware of, and I spoke of this when I made a, a presentation on uh, the surveillance uh, dynamics as well, or surveillance economics as well, and that is about the effect or the impact impact of emotions on our decisions. And that's very important. And I'm sure you will realize that when you are in a happy state of mind, you are more willing to forgive people or you are more willing to uh, justify the actions of the people. But at the same time, if you're angry or if you're outraged, then you will be making very different kind of choices. So uh, this is again a very important factor uh, of uh, you know using the effect heuristic. But uh, in most of the discussions that we are uh, talking about, we might not talk about effect heuristic. But this is one of the techniques that a lot of people 
employs specially during surveillance to find out your emotional state of mind at a particular time and based on that emotional state of mind they would try and push the products that you might not have otherwise bought a lot of the things you you end up buying on one of these uh, online platforms you buy because uh, you are in a good mood or you think that okay, i'm willing to spend more when otherwise if you are angry or if you are uh, uh, depressed or you feeling down for certain reasons you might not be making that decision at that point of time so now we go on to talk about the biases so uh, we will be talking about not in any particular serial order it's just uh, uh, a very random kind of an order but uh, when we are talking as media and communication uh, students it's important to uh, start with confirmation bias and that's a very important uh, element of uh, bias that we have to be aware of especially when we are talking about how people consume news or do not consume news or information and how they find a particular kind of information believable and the other kind of information uh, as not believable so often times we have a situation where uh, there are a lot of fact checkers and there are a lot of uh, 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 other theoretical inputs people provide about the kind of information so you might suggest that this is not true but there are very many people who are willing to believe that information to be true because it confirms the beliefs that they already have so if i already believed that this is, the party a is good and i get an information which suggests that party a is good i'm going to take that information more and if there is an information which tells me that party a is not good i'm going to disregard that information i'm not even going to read that information and it so happens with uh, our choice of television programs as well things that we do not believe in or when india is losing that odi we will not watch the uh, highlights we will just uh, switch off the channel and we will not talk about that so whatever things that we like to read or we like to be informed about we are uh, unconsciously at times going to look out only for that kind of an information so if there is a channel it could be anything many people would say that this is not good this is uh, uh, unfair so on and so forth but the, at the same time there might be some people who agree to all that information and they feel that that information is credible because that conforms to what they believe in all uh, they believe in so that's a very very important uh, bias to remember about that confirmation bias exists and very often it might not always be uh, the case with everybody it might be different with different personality types it might be uh, different for different people but it is present there in some form or the other and that is why the channels or the media outlets uh, they have to understand the audience perspective as well so from the audience perspective it's very very important for us to realize whether they are looking out for that particular information because of some kind of an inherent cognitive bias and we as communication scholars we also talk about uh, something known as theory of cognitive dissonance so if we are provided with information that does not resonate with the information which we already believe in then there is dissonance and then there is some kind of uh, uh, mental i won't call it trauma but there is some kind of a mental uh, dissonance or uh, disturbance that we want to avoid so confirmation bias is a very very important bias that exists and one reason that confirmation bias uh, exists is that people are motivated by argumentative reasons because i believe this to be true so we are looking for arguments that defend our opinion and that, that we will use to persuade others instead of looking for the truth so we are not looking for the uh, correct information but we are looking for information which uh, confirms the beliefs that i already have so there are reasons for that but uh, this is a very important bias that exists as i said there uh, the anchoring bias is again very very important and uh, there have been experiments this is as i said uh, based on uh, behavioral sciences and it's all based on a lot of experiments they do so uh, if th there was a question in one of these experiments people were asked to say uh, tell us how many countries are there in the african continent before asking the question they were randomly given a number just like that the number was 10 for one group for the other group the number was 45 for the group which were given the first number as 10 which is kind of an anchor for 
these this group says that there are 25 countries in the african continent and for the group which was uh, given 45 as the anchor number they said okay it's 65 so very often uh, our uh, uh, information or our uh, judgment of a particular situation is based on the information that is already known or which is first shown so if we know this person to be a bad person then we will start off with that anchor or if we uh, at times when we know that the price of this thing is uh, maybe 500 and if we get something uh, close to that then we go for that so the number that comes to mind or the number that you associate that or even the information you associate with that information that predetermines your final decision making so this is a kind of a tunnel vision this takes you into a particular tunnel so if you you are anchored on particular things and i'm sure you realize that when you talk about certain uh, numbers or certain figures and when you believe it to be true you uh, keep on harping on that because uh, as uh, th that is what is known as the anchoring bias so it's based on uh, what is the initial uh, number or the initial information that was provided to you uh, this again is related to uh, uh, at times it's related to spiral of silence but not directly this is about what you consider everybody else regards as uh, the truth or what everybody regards as uh, popular so if you consider that, oh, everybody is saying that this is good, so this may, might be good. So a lot of the uh, word of mouth effects and a lot of our, these things, they are because of the uh, bandwagon effect. So it is a bias favoring ideas that are already adopted by others. Oh, everybody is using a smartphone, so I think the smartphone is a good thing, so I should also go for that. Everybody is doing classes on Google Meet, so probably it's, it's uh, good. So uh, the rate and uh, which uh, you know it's, it's uh, adopted by others, it will uh, significantly uh, influence the likelihood of these uh, information being selected and taken forward. So this again exists in in, in many situations, especially as uh, as social beings, we are looking out for what everybody else is doing. This is another bias which uh, exists uh, without us even realizing that there is this bias. So very often, if you go to a particular uh, uh, online uh, site, commercial site, you will see it's, they say that only two left order quickly. And when you find out that there are, or, or uh, there are cases where in just one or two minutes, they will have that kind of a uh, uh, deal, uh, which is, which is, which is uh, a very quick kind of a deal. And, and then uh, either you get it or you don't get it. So if you think that, it is scarce a particular item is very scarce then we place a higher value on that particular object and a lower value on which the the, the one which is available in abundance as i said this is uh, i'm talking about the fast thinking process so if you find out that this is scarce and that's what it what happens whenever there's a lockdown or whatever and somebody says that this item is going to be scarce that people make a beeline for uh, that kind of an item or when people know that these kind of shops will be closed and there will be scarcity, so they, they might require and hold it even uh, it might not be needed for them in the first place. So the scarcity uh, bias is, is another uh, very real bias that exists, a very real cognitive bias that exists. Uh, the fifth uh, cognitive bias that I'm going to talk about is the projection bias. So uh, this assumes that other, uh, uh, you know, people they share our pattern attitudes beliefs and so on so you are projecting your thoughts into others you assume that everybody else is thinking the same way or uh, uh, since i think that this is the outcome this is what others might think as well so uh, there is another related effect which is the false uh, consensus bias and i decided to drop the false consensus bias because it was so related to uh, this uh, projection bias. So we hold the assumptions knowing that it is impossible for everyone to use the same mental framework we do. So we project our thought process into others. And it, it happens very often when as an Indian, you go out of the country. So you're so used to getting that free glass of water when you walk into a restaurant that when you go into a Western, Western restaurant, you have to pay for uh, water. Then you think that that could be a very... Uh, uh, you, you, you project initially that they will provide you water for free because uh, you think that their beliefs and their attitudes, this is just a very uh, commonplace example that I'm giving you. So uh, this bias makes us uh, think a lot of things that we don't. Or for example, when you go to an airport and you take one of those trolleys, in India you don't have to pay for that. 
and uh, in other places you're supposed to pay for that so you you uh, in our place you even you know grab it from somebody's hand if somebody is walking around and there if you grab it from somebody's hand you're actually you know doing the fraud are you doing some fraud or cheating the other person because he has paid 3 or 4 dollars for that trolley so you're projecting that that will that system also has the exact same kind of things that we do so this projection bias uh, often exists it can be about many many other instances i'm just giving you uh, examples of the bias and we can relate it to a lot of uh, everyday things that we do uh, the other uh, action bias i spoke of and i spoke of uh, the uh, uh, uh you know when i was talking about uh, the evolutionary uh, process or the evolutionary factors uh, responsible for these biases so action bias puts, pushes us to act when faced with ambiguity when there is an ambiguity and when there is a uh, uh, possibility of either doing something or doing nothing we often favor doing something without even any uh, analysis we think that okay, this needs an action so this leads to develop solutions when the problem itself hasn't been defined well the solution is not even required but this leads us to uh, developing these solutions so we need to appear active even if it does not lead to anything so we need to keep on doing things so this is the action bias that we are faced with in everyday life this again is a very important bias about how we judge other people how we regard other people so if there if there is somebody else who is very good at singing for example uh, then we assume that that person will be good at other uh, things also so for example uh, when we were younger and we would see some wonderful uh, cricketers on the cricket field somebody who could bowl very fast or bat very well and so on and so forth and we expected that person to be good in every other sense of the term but then very often many of those people were not very good with studies and all but uh, so that was a kind of a shock for many of us because if they are good at a we think that they will be good at b c or d or whatever or if somebody is speaking very well we think that he will be very good in singing and acting and dancing and everything else so these are uh, things which have been going on for very long and uh, the reverse also happens because somebody is not good at something we assume he will be bad at everything else so that halo uh, effect was discovered or first coined by edward thorndike in 1920 about their soldiers so when the soldiers who were being uh, good they were just good on all the factors and people who were seen as bad they were bad on all the factors so this is almost like the uh, erstwhile uh, hindi film heroes they were good at everything that they did from horse riding to singing to sword fighting to uh, dancing to studies to uh, um, nuclear material and everything so this is the halo effect that we assume every day so if there are people who are good at one thing we think that he or she will be good at everything else uh, the availability bias this also i spoke of when talking about uh, kahneman's work often our information is based on the immediate information that comes to mind uh, it's it's a shortcut that enables us to make sense of the world based on the information that we have lot of the times we do not have the right information or lot of the times we remember the rare happenings we don't remember the common place happenings we don't remember everyday happenings so often these quick decisions are based on overestimations of the dramatic or the vivid incidents that are easier to recall so when we talk about a particular place and if there is something dramatic that we associate that place with then we will assume that place to be based on that uh, uh, dramatic information that is available to us so it's based on the, these overestimations so availability bias is a very very important bias that it uh, that happens uh, with a lot of us based on the information that we have and as i said it's also based on the information processing capacity of our brains as well uh this is another very important bias so we are now at the midpoint and uh, very soon we'll reach the uh, 18th bias also so this favors outcome uh, this favors uh, the option so if there are more than one option then we will opt for the option whose outcome is knowable or whose outcome is uh, more or less guaranteed than those whose outcome is not known so often when we were as as the newspaper uh, some editors will tell you often when you are looking for a good headline whatever fits onto the block for first and it looks good we take it we may not even go beyond that because otherwise it might lead to more ambiguity 
so uh, this this impacts a lot of innovation outcomes although there is a bias which is uh, almost exact opposite of that we'll talk about that also but often we go for out uh, for those options whose outcomes are more or less knowable or whose outcomes we know so that bias also exists uh the outcome bias is another uh, uh, bias where we uh, assess the quality of a decision based on the uh, quality of the outcome so it's uh, slightly different from ambiguity where we are not we are avoiding ambiguity and here we are uh, aware of the uh, uh, outcome we know about the uh, outcome so if there is uh, something which leads to a positive outcome then that will be viewed positively so if there are shortcuts which do not appear good but it leads to a positive outcome that you are able to uh, perform a particular uh, action properly or you are uh, able to perform that particular action to everybody's satisfaction then you will go for that particular process so if the outcome is positive then very often we might not be very very uh, concerned with the process itself so similarly if a decision which is uh, leads to a negative count, kind of an outcome that will be viewed negatively and we might not go for such uh, uh, processes framing effect another very very important thing related to uh, media and communication and uh, this is straight way related to kahneman's work and uh, this is uh, this particular thing was uh, another of his articles as i said i'll be talking about another of his articles in this particular thing so this was uh, in this uh, particular journal american psychologist uh, in 1984 uh, 39th volume the fourth edition from these pages and this talks about the choices values and frames so uh, framing theory is a very very important theory that we study in uh, uh, our media and communication classes and uh, that's where how uh, we frame the same thing in two different ways the same situation the same exact situation might be framed differently and uh, kahneman and tversky uh, talk about this as a prospect theory so if uh, they are talking about and this is from the uh, book itself and this is there are a lot many things that uh, this book talks about i'm just giving you one very sim simple example so when uh, you are sure about uh, you know how many people will be saved then you probably go for that particular option so here they talk about there is a uh, unusual asian disease which is expected to kill 600 people there are two alternate programs if you adopt program a 200 people will be saved but if you adopt program b there is one third probability that 600 people will be saved and two third probability that no people will be saved so this is kind of a survival kind of a frame that they are providing and when you provide these kind of options people will always go for an option although both of these things mean mean exactly same and when we talk of the rational human being a rational human being is supposed to take both of these options the same because it, it means roughly the same in statistics in the other also you know there is a chance that uh, 200 people will be saved and uh, 400 will not be saved but since this talks of this as a very uh, this is framed as something very uh, uh, specific people will go for program a as you can say in the bracket that 72% of the people they would opt for program a and only 28 people would uh, opt for program b because there is a risk element that they are talking about a one third probability and here there is a certainty that 200 people will be saved if the same thing is uh, framed very differently and th there are many other things about that maybe at a future lecture i will be able to talk about framing and all then i'll talk about all these things in much more greater detail but how the things are framed to you determines how you're going to react to that so here with the same kind of information presented to you as uh, one of the uh, uh, options as uh, certainly leading to 200 people being saved you're going to take that option so your mental shortcuts are determined by this framing effect and even in the uh, case of public relations there are different ways in which uh, a situation can be framed in which the attribute or a person of the uh, or, or of a person or a company can be framed how choices can be framed how the actions you are taking can be framed it's about uh, talking about people uh, 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 you know when you are firing people and how you frame that uh, action so if you frame that as streamlining or uh, something that the company is do doing to uh, make uh, everybody uh, 
uh, everybody else's job better then you might uh, go for that particular option which otherwise you might not uh, uh, you might not have supported that kind of a thing so it depends on uh, how the choices are framed how the actions are framed how the issues are framed how the responsibility i mean at the end of the day whom do you hold responsible so how the responsibility is framed and how the news are framed so there are different framing steps which will determine how people react to these events how people uh, or how this biases their decisions or how that biases their judgments pro innovation bias this is another bias which is as i said a slightly different from the ambiguity bias that we spoke of earlier so new innovations should be adopted and whenever there is a newness a lot of people will regard it as inherently good and this is what happens with a uh, technology a lot of fake news uh, is very easy to spread on whatsapp because there are many people out there uh, of course none of them in, in this group who are present in this online class but for many people the very fact that this is in a new technology that means it has to be true so you might have heard people saying that oh i heard this on facebook i heard this on whatsapp so this has to be true so uh, whenever there is something new so we uh, there is a lot of public opinion about that leading to some very good impact so whenever there has been a new media new media in terms of you know when we had television people thought uh, television will take care of all all ills of the society then we had the internet people thought that internet will take or even the radio so whenever there is a uh new technology there is a lot of uh, technological determinism in that particular aspect where people believe that uh, the impact will be inherently good uh, regardless of the potential negative impacts there might and we are even willing to forego these potential negative impacts so when we talk of smart cities we might not even think about the environmental damage etc that is done so we uh, are uh, we go for the pro innovation bias in that situation another uh, bias that uh, clouds our decision or which affects our decision making is the recency uh, recent e events are much more easier to remember and that can uh, and this weighs heavily more than the past event so something which was done recently and that is why people keep on saying that the public memory is short or things like that when people say public memory is short what they intend to say is that people remember your uh, last performance or the recent pronouncements much more than that kohli might have scored 49 centuries but in last match if he doesn't play well then you're going to feel bad about it or about any other things if you remember the recent events are are good about that person or if i'm asking you to draw up uh, the all time favorite indian team it it will depend on on your age on how you uh, regard uh, which person to be an all time best so if there is a younger person he might be having more members from the present team if there is a slightly older member he would be talking of the things which were recent during his times so there are different ways in which we define this recency so most importantly the recent events are the one we remember because we uh, whenever new information comes it replaces unless the uh, information was dramatic to start with that is then another uh, idea false causality bias so very often we attribute false causes and uh, we keep on saying this in our uh, research classes that correlation does not mean causality so often we attribute false causes for example uh, uh if there is dry hot and sunny uh, summer weather uh, although the last summer was uh, one where we could hardly uh, go for ice creams outside but generally uh, this causes ice creams or maybe this hot uh, uh, sunny weather it uh, causes a lot of sunburn if you are out out in the sun very often but if you try to attribute that ice cream causes the sunburn because i've been having uh, more ice cream and that's why i had more sunburn that would be a false causality because that is just a correlation that is no causation so that is what i meant by uh, when i said that uh, when i spoke of the false causality bias so uh, what is causation and what is correlation has to be very clear and very often this associative thing as i said that our mind is looking for these associations so when we attribute false causes then we make these uh, uh, wrong judgments because then we are probably uh leading the wrong problems or we are, or it happens in the design thinking phase when we attribute something 
to a particular cause when that particular cause might not be true in the first place. Again, this is a very, very important thing, and especially with the young people and others, it's important to realize that very often, and I'm sure that many of us will find this to be very relevant to our own everyday lives. Very often, we assume that the entire world is watching us. Or if I write any, anything wrong, or if I say anything wrong, or if I do anything wrong, everybody else is noticing. And that is a spotlight effect, and which probably is true in certain senses, because our world revolves around us. So uh, that's why we are the center of the universe for ourselves. But that does not mean that uh, we are under a constant uh, spotlight. So we overestimate the number of people who are consciously paying attention to our actions. So uh, this is the, 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 the egocentrism is, is uh, suggested to be one of the reasons for this particular bias. So even if we make a small mistake, maybe during presentations, we believe that everybody would have witnessed and I, uh, people start feeling bad about that. But the truth is that people are not always paying that much attention on you all the time. So if you assume that everybody else is watching you and you, they might feel bad at uh, how you're wearing your glasses or how you're talking or how you're reacting to things or what, it may not be true. So it's again a bias which makes us feel or do things or judge things which may not be true all the time. This is another very important bias, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So as we are nearing, we are talking about the more technical ones. So uh, this one assumes that very often people overestimate their ability. There are people especially who uh, have not worked on anything and if you ask them, say, oh yes, yes, I will do that. Don't worry, I, will, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I can manage anything. So very often people with a low ability, they overestimate their ability. It is, it is uh, because of some illusory superiority or it comes from inability to recognize their lack of ability. So we had cases like, you know, the Dhinchak Puja, where probably she did not realize how bad a singer she was. But then probably people overestimate their uh, abilities and uh, the uh, often it is comical, but it might not be comical to the other person. So often people are not aware of their shortcomings and they tend to deny their failures. So they even fail to acknowledge the gap between the actual performance and how I perceive ourselves. So uh, there are, you know, all these memes about how you perceive, how you're doing and how the world perceives you. They might be very different. You might be thinking that, you know, your croaky voice is very similar to uh, Kishore Kumar's, for example. But if you uh, put it out on YouTube uh, and let other uh, others decide, it will not be uh, what you think you are. So often these cognitive biases are very difficult for us to realize in ourselves. It's very easy for us to see that in others. So uh, this uh, Dunning-Kruger effect is another effect that uh, uh, causes this uh, cognitive bias about uh, your own overestimation. This is, uh, uh, again, a very, very important uh, thing to know. And I will just share a particular uh, diagram. And from there, uh, I'll try and explain what this survivorship bias means. So just uh, see this particular, uh, forget about the COVID, I'll talk about COVID later on. So th these are the World War II planes and this is how they would return. That these are the places where they have been attacked. These are all the holes on the plane. These are, these are the holes on the plane. And uh, whenever they would come back to the hangar, the military experts would say that, oh my God, these are the weak areas. So let's just cover this up so that uh, the next time uh, it does not get hit that properly. Now, there was a statistician by the name of Wald. He said, no, no, this is not correct because you are missing out on something very important. These are the planes that have returned even after being hit. So they have survived. So the very fact that they have survived doesn't mean that these are the weak spots. Maybe the others, they have been hit here and they have not survived and they have gone spiral down and they have been destroyed. So very often, a lot of our decisions are based on the people or on the situation who have survived a particular situation. We are not aware of the ones we have not survived, so uh, who, have, who haven't survived. So we talk of entrepreneurs, we talk of uh, cases, case studies, we talk, talk of people and we talk about all the people who are doing well or, 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 or who are out there in the ambulance. But there are a lot of people who are absolutely invisible. And that is where the survivorship bias comes in. 
So this is a very, very important bias in the field of behavioral sciences. And uh, this was uh, by this uh, statistical research group at Columbia University. They, they, they examined the damage study to aircraft and they found out the uh, most hit areas of the plane did not need additional uh, armor, but on the areas that showed the least damage. So the statistical research group uh, led by Wald is a, a very, very famous statistician. He said that, uh, that the areas showed the least damage that required the most uh, uh, additional uh, support, not the um, US military's conclusion that the most hit areas needed additional armor. The additional armor was needed in the areas that were uh, least hit because it's a, uh, it suggested that most of the planes who were hit here and here and here and here they could not return. They did not survive. These are the ones who survived. So uh, that is one very important uh, bias that we must be aware of. So this arises due to the uh, error of concentrating on people on things that made it past that selection process. So we know about people who came through the college system. What about those who did not? Because of, uh, of that, we have to be uh, knowing about what are the things that was lacking in them. So when you're talking about some people who have past certain uh, uh, selection process, then we are only talking about the people who have survived. But we have to concentrate also on the people who are not visible. So uh, that also is a bias that creeps into a lot of our decisions. And the last one is the Pelzman effect. It's also known as the risk compensation bias. So again, I will uh, give you a sporting kind of uh, metaphor which will explain this easier. A lot of these batsmen, they have so much of the protective gear, the helmets and the arm guard and the chest guard and the uh, thigh guard and the you know back guard or whatever, that they assume that you know they do not need to take any, uh, they can take a lot of risk because they are all protected. So a lot of uh, people in rugby and ice hockey, they had a lot of uh, problems with their necks and many other places because they acted in a manner in which they thought that there is no risk, which happens to many of us who are uh, using uh, these antivirus software. So we assume that, oh, we can go to any place and the virus will never attack. And anybody who has uh, done that knows that that, that 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 can be so very dangerous. So this risk compensation bias is, uh, uh, you know, explained through uh, pro this process of risk homostasis. And according to this uh, theory, risk is an inherent part of our nature. And since we assume that uh, we will not be affected, we keep on taking these uh, chances, which otherwise we, would, we wouldn't have uh, done that. So right from the uh, uh, confirmation bias to... Uh, uh, so I'll just you know remind you of all the biases that I spoke of. I spoke of the confirmation bias. I spoke of the anchoring bias. I spoke of the bandwagon effect. I spoke of the scarcity bias. I spoke of the projection bias. I spoke of the action bias, the halo effect, where we assume everybody um, to be similar on, on various attributes, the availability bias, the information that you make on the information that is available to you, the judgments you make on that, the ambiguity bias, the outcome bias, the framing effect, the pro-innovation bias, the recency, the false causality bias, the spotlight effect, the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, the survivorship bias, and finally the Pelzman effect or the uh, risk compensation bias. So uh, with this, I uh, end my presentation here. If you have any questions, uh, please, uh, you can ask me here. Um, good, good evening, sir. Very good evening. My name is Rahul Tripathi. I have huh. a, a detailed question on this. Uh, sir, uh, as you have told about cognitive biases, uh, mm -hmm. which are based on various things like feelings, emotions, preconceived notions and informations, mm -hmm. but a human being always have the capacity to decide between a cognitive bias and a conscious thinking, a mindful thinking to do something while he's planning to do something and take decisions which can be more beneficial to him or for his future academics and everything like that. So are, is conscious thinking also somewhere uh, uh, is, is influenced by your biases? As, as I said uh, in one of those uh, initial slides, there are these two systems of uh, cognitive processes that goes on within us. 
One is the fast process, which is based on these uh, mental shortcuts, so on and so forth, based on the uh, uh, information that we already have or based on availability, etc., etc. So in those kinds of systems or in those kinds of cases, we are expending very little cognitive energy. And that is why it is known as the system one or fast thinking. In those processes where we uh, show a greater amount of control, where we use more of our cognitive abilities, which is based more on agency, as I suggested, that is where you, th this bias can be avoided. So when we talk of uh, uh, cognitive biases, it means that there are these two processes which goes on with us simultaneously. So it does not mean that we can simply do away with the system one way of thinking and uh, leave out the uh, mental shortcuts or not because it's there, it's always there. So the moment we, when we talk of first impressions or these uh, uh, intuitive uh, actions or intuitive beliefs, this will always be there. But they are there within us. And as I said, it's very easier for us to realize this in others. Of course, mm. there are ways of, of uh, taking care of that. One of them is uh, uh, Edward D. Bono's six thinking hats and uh, other ways where they ask us to slow down and think of all those six parts. But this intuitive thinking is there, especially in cases where the time is short, whether when you just see a person just flashing by. You are not going to ask that person to stop and you know talk, uh, ask questions of him or whatever. You make decisions of that particular person. When an information comes to you immediately, there are there is a reflex action. It's not as I say, it's not even conscious. So that there, happens there, sub subconsciously. That takes it happens, place subconsciously. It, it, it takes place sub subconsciously. So we, you are not even. That's why I started off with the explanation first, where we provided the fact that all much of this might not be within our control we might not be even be aware about it. So should human beings always uh, try to control this? Means they have an intuitive I, thing. Should I, they I, always try to control this? No, I, 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 I'm i not saying that. I'm saying that uh, very often. In fact, uh, uh, if you remember my first few slides, I, I, I even said that very often it may, may be correct as well. Often uh, all these estimates are correct or useful. But just to suggest that there are cases where or we must be aware of these biases that exist. As I said, some of this can be can have uh, far-reaching consequences. So say, for example, the survivorship bias. I mean, only because you sat down to think about it or only when the statisticians, uh, statisticians not the experts, the military experts, and very naturally, right, this is where it has been dented. This is where this has been hit. Let's only replace that part. But it requires a lot more insight into uh, that particular uh, case to find out uh, whether uh, it needs uh, more uh, reinforcement on the other parts of it. So, as I said, it's not necessarily bad, but just the idea, just the knowledge that this exists, or as a content provider, I must be aware of the confirmation bias amongst the audience. If I'm not aware of this confirmation okay. bias amongst yes, the sir. audience, then uh, a lot of the things might not be correct. So, it is, it is yes, there. Sir. So, the, the realization is uh, more important. Yes, thank, you, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Raul, for the question. Yeah. If anybody else yeah. has any, yeah, I just want to uh, know. I mean, is there a relationship between this bias and experience? This through experience, yeah. yeah. So these these mental shortcuts, as I said, the judgment under uh, certainty, it's it's based on your uh, one of the perspective in which I answered, or one of the explanations is the ecological perspective. So it is based on a sum of uh, it is uh, one of the uh, uh, reasons is that it's based on your experiences. So of course, experience is one of the reasons for these biases. We spoke of uh, uh, two or three other reasons also. And there are some other uh, uh, neural networks processes also. But basically, the three uh, explanations that we provided, one was the cognitive psychological, the other was this uh, ecological, the third was evolutionary. So we have all these uh, three processes, these three examples, uh, these three explanations. Thank you so much, Professor Paul, for your question. OK, thanks. Anybody else? Sir, uh, I'll, uh, one more question, sir. Ha, ha, sure. Uh, uh, most part of your presentation was based on uh, thinking past and slow, that book, or it was from various other places, sir? The explanation was from uh, thinking fast and uh, flow, uh, fast and slow. The other was from all the other works. Okay. So I mean, just, not, if, if I wanted to know some more details about the things so, that you're uh, because it was but, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's why you know we uh, make the effort of doing it. And 
Yes, I'm, I'm so happy that you uh, find it useful. Thinking fast and slow is one of the beginning, or they provide a lot of explanation. But as I said, there are many, many other books, or there are many other uh, pop psychology attempts at uh, trying to explain these. But uh, the knowledge is very important. Thinking yes, fast sir. and slow, I have the hard copy available. So when I buy hard copies, it means uh, I find it very interesting. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Rahul. Any anybody else? Any questions? So I take the opportunity to thank all my uh, super colleagues in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Shurendranath College for Women, women uh, Shottabrato Paul, Shabani Mukhopadhyay, Ushoshi Rai Sengupta, Konka Mojumdar, Atushi Bhattacharya, Ananya Sen, and Jyoti Shao for their wonderful work because we are in the midst of uh, a very important assessment and all those exercises. So the fact that we could manage to get this going speaks very highly of your commitment, your dedication, your efficiency in everything. Thank you students, thank you colleagues, thank you everybody for uh, joining today. It's been a pleasure preparing all this uh, uh, and sharing this with you. We will, as I say, keep on sharing this material with uh, you through YouTube and all. And uh, thank you to all my uh, colleagues from other places as well. I can see Deborshi, I can see Shomik, I can see uh, uh, many other people, I can see Shamina, I can see Shamita Madam, I can see uh, others as well. So thank you everybody uh, for, for joining uh, and thank you for your uh, uh, good wishes. Hopefully we'll come back with uh, more such sessions in the future. Thank you very much. I take your leave now. Thank you, sir. And I hope you have all uh, filled up the feedback form carefully. Yes. Sir. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot.